talk a little bit about the burden of TV and why it's sort of important even here in Colorado. And then um, present a couple cases to kind of highlight some of the challenges that we face at Denver Health, uh, particularly among our uh, primary care patients. And then we'll, if we have time, we'll talk about uh, the evaluation for active TB and then also a bit about latent TB. Um, and then when you can refer um, patients to public health and some resources for that. So, since we're a small group, you know, we can um, So, you guys may or may not have known this, but TB is the leading cause of death from an infection globally. Um, so, it surpassed HIV and malaria. Wow. Be known for. Um, so there are 1.7 million deaths in 2016. And, um, you know, when you start uh, thinking about how many people had TB, so there are 10.4 million people with TB in 2016. And then 600,000 of those individuals had um, MDR TB. So MDR TB is defined as resistance to um, isolizing and bringing them together. Um, it's very difficult to treat. Um, you know, if you want, so, and this kind of highlights that, so only one in five people um, who need MDR TB treatment were enrolled on it. And as of, I think, 2015, I don't have more recent numbers, there were 12,000 people globally on waiting lists. Um, so what that means is you're diagnosed with your MDR TB and you're told to go home and cough on your family and your coworkers until all the drugs become available. Um, so that's a big crisis, and while we're fortunate in that even though we see that most people affected by TB in the U.S. are from outside of the United States, we've lived extensively outside the U.S. Um, we don't have that, have many people affected by MDRT here in the United States, um, but it might be something that we see depending on how um, the one migration patterns evolve over time. So bringing it a little closer to home, so in the U.S., um, you know, we don't have the most recent numbers from 2017. They usually release those around World TV Day, which is March 24th. Um, I can tell you anecdotally that I wouldn't be surprised if case numbers were up uh, for 2017 because our um, case numbers were up in the Denver metro area. So last, so 2016, there were 48 people with active TB, and as of, I think we had 58 as the last case number, so our numbers are higher. And then um, I think we hit 80, 80 cases, 80 people with active TB in Colorado in 2017. And last year, um, there were just 64, so I'll get to that in the next slide. So across the U.S., um, just 9,200, just over 9,200 people with active TB in 2016, so fewer numbers. Um, there's some health disparities in terms of who's affected by TB, which shouldn't surprise anyone. Um, so this is the overall incidence. You can kind of see a flattening over time. And then among U.S. born persons, you can see this really nice gradual downward trend and only sort of a recent flattening. And there's a much you know, sort of gentler slope among people who were born or lived outside the United States. And so, you know, when we think about trying to scale up interventions or engage uh, people at risk, you know, these are the folks that we want to try to focus on and make sure that they have access to services. So and then here in Colorado, you can kind of see things sort of bounce around. Um, you know, in uh, the most recent numbers are actually here, so it's actually 64. Um, and then as I mentioned, we're still gathering information, but I think it, it's going to be close to 80 for across the, across the state. And so we haven't been that high since um, 2009. Don't know exactly what's going on, you know, why there's an uptick, and maybe it is just sort of this natural wobble um, because we're a lower burden state, but, um, you know, we'll be taking a closer look at that to try to see, you know, if there's any patterns in terms of who we need to reach out to. Um, 2016 was also a really tough year um, because there were 11 deaths of people who had a diagnosis of TB, um, and there were three people who were diagnosed uh, postmortem. And um, and of those, so of those three diagnosed postmortem, they died as a result of. Um, so there were three of the three deaths that were diagnosed postmortem. Those were the three that died because of TB. We think we don't know for sure. And then there were three people who were alive at their diagnosis, but then eventually died from TB. So that's a, a, unusual, fortunately. Um, we usually don't see that many people um, dying from die from or with TB in Colorado, but I think it also has sort of on the public health side, um, you know, caused us to sort of do some self-examination about how we can re engage um, you guys on the front lines to make sure that people are funneled to us, if you guys are concerned they have active TB, you have resources available to you, um, and then you can screen people who, um, you know, who don't have symptoms who might be. 
so then how many people are infected? Well, we don't, you know, we don't know for sure. Um, we think that two billion of the world's population is infected with T, so it's super common. So that's sometimes some messaging that I, you know, you know, use with patients, um, you know, because there's still a lot of stigma associated with TB, and so anything that we can do to kind of normalize that, like, oh, everybody's got, you know, better or worse, sometimes can be helpful. Um, you know, these are based on the um, NHANES uh, population survey from 2012, um, looking at um, tuberculosis skin test uh, prevalence. And so you can see just sort of these two graphs comparing people who never traveled to a TB endemic area to those folks who traveled or lived in a TB endemic area, so people born, mostly born outside the United States. And you can see that prevalence is higher. Really not much difference between um, the first two um, air, um, years of the survey or, or groups of years of the survey. And from these estimates, we estimate that in the United States, there's, there may be 13 million people with latent tuberculosis. Um, and then here in Colorado, we using these estimates, we estimate there's 158,000 people with latent TB here in Colorado. That's a lot. Um, so how does this sort of play out um, in a primary care setting? Um, so this is one patient who was at Denver Health. She was in care at Denver Health, and I wanted to share her story with you guys um, just to kind of highlight some of the, the challenges that I think we all face when we do primary care. I do HIV primary care. Um, and so sometimes, you know, I sort of learned that <laughs> sometimes when there's a lot of chaos in the visit and you want to get to the primary care, the preventative health stuff, sometimes you just can't. And I think her story kind of highlights some of that. Um, so she's 28. Um, she was originally from Mexico, and she actually uh, presented to Denver Health Primary Care five years before this visit. It really was presenting for a well child, or uh, not well child, but 20s coming up, um, just a well visit. And um, there's some discussion in the notes about talking about pap smear and what have you and vaccinations. Um, there wasn't anything documented about assessing TB risk. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. I just, you know, we just couldn't find it. And, um, it really was doing well at that point. Um, and then, you know, kind of fell out of care and then came back to um, that same clinic um, five years later and said, you know, I've been coughing for a couple months. Um, and the provider, you know, did a physical exam, noticed some wheezing, and uh, offered her an inhaler and scheduled her for pulmonary function tests. And we were diagnosis was reactive airway disease. So, pretty typical. I mean, I don't think anybody, I certainly wouldn't have gotten a chest x ray at that point. Um, and it really wouldn't be indicated, you know, if you hear wheezing. You know, and the, there's some documentation about return precautions and, you know, if you don't get better, just come back and, and see me. And so she did get better, um, but she wasn't able to go to the clinic. She instead went to urgent care. Um, and this is her chest x-ray. So, um, so you guys who are sitting here probably get a better view of that. Um, so if you kind of look backwards, you can kind of appreciate there are sort of micro nodules throughout and some larger nodules on the upper lobes. Um, you almost get the sense that maybe there's some lymphadenopathy here, but that's certainly not something you would call right away. You know, probably the big take-home message is that you know, it looks like micronodules. So this is miliary TB. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. It's a little atypical, uh, but that's what this is. Um, so the radiologist read this as an atypical pneumonia. And I suspect what happened is what happens to all of us is that you're busy, you're in an urgent care, you know, you look at the read because you don't have time to look at the x-ray yourself, you know, and, um, and so you say, oh, it's a typical pneumonia, so we'll treat for any typical pneumonia. Um, so that's what happened. And so she got uh, five days of the of the surprise. So she didn't actually come back to that same primary care provider until five months later and was like, you know, I'm still coughing. So the primary care provider reviews the records. Um, and noticed that she's lost some weight and noted the chest x-ray findings and um, you know beefed up her regimen to treat for reactive airways disease but also was concerned enough said gosh she needed to see pulmonary um, and referred her to pulmonary and ordered a ct scan of the chest so she got a ct scan of the chest uh, which is here and you can pretty it's pretty easy to appreciate the micronodular disease on um, this is just one slice of her ct and again no sort of discussion, maybe it was thought about, but no discussion about TB risk um, and, and thinking about TB. So um, a month after that visit, she went to the ED, she's continuing to cough, she's now tachycardic. She's discharged from the ED and then she went to pulmonary clinic. So seen by an attending that I know really well, who's an excellent provider, 
um, used to work at the TB clinic. Um, and they assessed her and they thought, well, maybe this is bronchiolitis. They also did a really careful chart review and um, found in a, a note sort of tucked away that um, showed that she was actually, actually had a scope even before that initial primary care visit that she was having diarrhea. And the scope showed, they did it, they did a, um, ileocecal biopsy that showed granulomas, or granulomas inflammation, um, and so the working diagnosis way back when was maybe it was Crohn's, and then she was never able to follow up, the diarrhea was all, and then, you know, five years later she goes for the well visit. So they thought, well, maybe this is some extra-intestinal manifestation of inflammatory bowel disease and kind of anchored to that diagnosis, um, and said, you know, we'd really like to bronch you. Um, her copay for a bronch was $250. Um, she didn't have health insurance. And um, they said, we'd love to take care of you, come back when you're able to schedule your bronch. And so she was discharged from the So now we're seven months into her illness, and she goes to the headache this time, or goes to the ED. This time she's got headache and nausea vomiting. And she also has a sore throat. So they did a rapid strep that was positive, and they said, well, maybe this is all a strep. And they noted her imaging showed no acute findings. So she goes back a couple more times and is like, you know, I'm still having headaches. She's now having visual disturbances in front of the She was diagnosed with a tension headache and told to follow with her primary care provider. Two days later, eight months into her illness, um, she's confused, somnolent, and her family takes her to Good Sam. And there, she has an MRI of the brain, which shows findings consistent with meningitis, and she finally gets an LP. And it's obviously abnormal with an elevated white count, pretty classic for TB, low glucose, high protein. And um, the PCR was positive in the CSF. So, um, and this should tell you something. So the PCR, so TB meningitis is actually usually a clinical diagnosis um, because it's usually positive acillary, so often the cultures are even negative. And the sensitivity of culture is about 10 organisms per ml. And so the fact that her PCR was positive tells you that she has a tremendous amount of disease in her CNS and elsewhere. So at that point, she was too sick to cough up the specimen, and so she did get her bronch, um, which was near positive. Um, they also sent a Q of T, which was positive. Each of you was negative. And um, she developed seizures, had to go to the ICU, and um, was finally started on TB treatment and was profoundly debilitated when I met her in clinic for the first time and almost unable to care for her. So I can see everybody in the room. Horrified. <laughs> yeah, so they, I tell this story and everybody's like, oh my god, I can't believe that happened. But yes, we can. you can see how it happens. It happens yeah. to us where you get busy and you don't think you can't you don't have time to think about these things. Um, I think of her as a preventable case because her chronic nerve was positive, so she had evidence of TB infection. And so if we had some sort of system in place or the ability for her to have gotten on a or even a TST at that well track, that that's a well um, visit, and that first time that she saw her PCP, conceivably none of this would have ever happened to her. So, um, and it, you know, and it, and also I think highlights the point that like you know I know everybody who took care of her, and everyone who took care of her is very bright, very diligent, very dedicated. You know, I, mean, I feel proud to work at Denver Health, and yet this still happened. And so it's not. It's not really, you know, it's not any fault of the providers. It's, I think, it, I see this as a systems issue, and that we need to figure out how to create better systems to support us um, to screen people at risk. Any thoughts besides, you know, other key steps along the way that hey, this could have been different, like maybe the reading of the CT scan, yeah, so etc. Like, it, like if, the, if you had your like top few places that you could have paused, and that ate one of us. I think the reading of the CT, the, the CT for sure, um, even the reading of the chest x-ray, um, I think that, you know, and this is a little bit harder, like if you're thinking someone might be at risk for TB and they have an abnormal x-ray, um, then the next step is to get sputum for T, for AFB, noting that like get a quantum neuron. Like if you think someone has active TB, the next step is to look for active TB. And the only way you look for active TB is to get sputum. Um, or, you know, got a lymph node that's full and then you biopsy that lymph node. Um, I think the other challenge in her um, hospital course with, or her clinical course was that when she started having headaches and photophobia, that first time that she presented to the emergency room, she should have had a head CT and an LP. 
um, because the 28 year old woman you know, shouldn't have phobia. Um, and and I'm not sure exactly why that decision, you know, what the decision was that, you know, that where they didn't do that. But that I think would be another potential uh, way that we could have maybe intervened a little bit earlier, although that was already eight months in front of us. So let's talk about how to identify people at risk for TB infection. Um, so this is our local um, risk assessment. And so we tried to, to simplify things. Um, so anybody, um, and so we focus mostly on epidemiologic risk. Um, you know, we obviously we have an active um, program testing homeless patients um, here in Denver, um, you know, and you'll read about, you know, IV drug use being a risk, which honestly might start to become more of a problem. I think we need to kind of look at our, um, some of the most recent cases, we'll talk about that later. But, but by and large, you know, two thirds of people who um, are affected by active TB in Colorado have lived outside of Colorado, lived outside the US. So you can just start here with, you know, identifying people who've um, lived for at least two months or more. And so that way that captures kids who go visit, you know, grandparents um, for the summer. Um, but that's at the US for two months or more, born in a country with an elevated TB prevalence. And so elevated includes Mexico greater than 20 or so per 100,000. Um, they automatically should get um, screened, either with a tuberculin skin test or chronic care. That's it. Um, and then, you know, anybody who tells you they've been in contact with someone with active TB, you know, we, we will see folks in the Denver metro area who are contacts, but sometimes, you know, you guys might see someone like, oh yeah, you know, I went back to Vietnam and my grandpa was coughing and he was diagnosed with active TB and I was visiting with them. You know, you might get that history um, from your patients. And so we wouldn't necessarily know about that person as a contact. And then current or planned immunosuppression um, are also folks who should be screen and that's really it and then if you're thinking about testing someone for TB infection you should also do a quick assessment to whether or not they have symptoms that might fit um, with active TB which actually could be anything um, but sort of the big ones are pulmonary TB um, you know because that is transmissible and so you want to ask people about cough um, for more than two to three weeks um, in addition to other symptoms with a caveat that cough duration even though we're always taught to weeks, it's a really poor predictor of TB. I mean, most of us think about the last time you're sick, you don't really know how long you're coughing, you're just sick, you know you're coughing. So, but, but in the absence of how to screen people appropriately in a low instance setting like ours, um, that's kind of what we're left with. So, asking people about symptoms, and if you're concerned at all that someone might have active TB, then you should call us in the TB clinic, because we can usually see people that afternoon. Um, usually the barrier is not that we can't see them, um, it's, it's getting people having transportation to get to us. Um, we can pick people up and bring them in. Our outreach staff um, sort of accept that risk um, and uh, we'll transport them with us now maybe. But, but in any case, we can we can provide some assistance with transportation for people if you're really worried about them. Just give us a call. So I get, um, this is where I get confused, is us yes. um, two months or more in or born in a country i mean we see people all the time sure. right born in these countries um especially in mexico but also all these other countries and whether or not they have a tb test when they came into the country a lot of our patients don't know like when right. we ask them and i don't know if i can assume that that was done i mean if they went through proper channels to become a citizen like i'm sure that they had it done but a lot of our patients yeah. So I feel like this has happened to me where I've asked patients, they don't know, I do a TB like skin test and then it's positive and then I ask Ed and he's like, well why'd you do the TB skin test because <laughs> yeah. this person was yeah. really high risk and he shows me some crazy algorithm yeah. why I should not have done it and I get lost. Yeah. Just... Um, so so folks who are seeking permanent residency who come, who, um, come through that pathway, to move to the US actually don't get a test for TB infection. They just okay. get a chest x-ray. Okay. Um, now status adjusters, so folks who are here who go through an INS exam, they do get a TST or an IGRA, depending on um, what's available. So those folks would have a test. So, but sometimes, you know, it's been a long time. People, you're right, people don't remember, or they may not know how they actually, you know, came, you know to, right. to be in the US, or they may not want to share um, because it may not have been um, to the Right. So, um, so that's, it's true that so the if you have the resources available, 
the better test to offer someone who's been BCG vaccinated is a quantiferon or an IGRA or an interferon gamma release assay. And that's because it's more specific for testing for TB infection. But if you don't have those resources available, you can still do a direct skin test. Um, if they're positive, though, then you really you probably should follow it up with an IGRA okay. um, because there's a chance that that could be a false positive on an ECG. But if they're negative, then you're good. And then if you get the, the IGRA isn't perfect either, right? So at what point do you need to have that chest or x ray as well? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I, both IGRA and TST will miss up to 25% of people with active TB. Mm -hmm. We actually don't know how often they're missing people with latent TB. Right. Um, you know, the, the other problem with these tests is that there's really no gold standard for diagnosing latent TB because you can't culture it, you can't really identify it. You're only relying on the person's immune system to generate a response to TB antigen. Mm -hmm. So if someone, if someone has an issue with their immune system and they just, you know, they, you know, not everybody responds to TB antigens even though they're otherwise healthy, um, then you're gonna miss that person. Wow. Yeah. But yeah, up to probably up to 25% of people with late TB, is my guess, we're probably just flat out missing because we have terrible tests. Um, yeah, so, um, and we start, I see people all the time now through TB clinic that have to be in their Nigeria was negative. Um, and they're healthy otherwise, so it's not kind of overwhelming TB. So you do the best you can with the tests that you have. And so, you know, counsel people appropriately, like it doesn't completely exclude, you know, if they've, you know, been traveling or lived in a TV endemic area, it doesn't yeah. completely rule out active TV. But, um, but you offer them screening. Anyway, in terms of chest x-ray, the only time I would I don't necessarily move to doing a chest x-ray is in someone that I'm concerned might have active TV. Okay. So, so even in our HIV positive patients who have, you know, low T cells, you know, 50, you'd expect to be energetic um, and often are, then, you know, they, we don't necessarily do a chest x-ray in those folks. Um, you know, we would just, you know, start them on ART and we can repeat when their T cells are above 200. But it's possible they can develop back to be in that area. So if somebody has a positive test and then you do the quantiferon and it's negative, you would just stop there. Yes. You wouldn't get a chest x-ray. Now, if you can't do the quantiferons, then um, for whatever reason, then you do need to go ahead and do a chest x-ray and trust that TST and treat it as a true positive, and recognizing so, its limitations. Right, so then if the chest x-ray is negative, but then we're just assuming that person has the TB. And so you might end up treating someone who just got vaccinated with BCG right. if they don't fit the number. Right. And at this point, this is our, our like, $100,000 million dollar struggle. Right, right, right. right. We really don't have the systems and the money in place for us to PPD everybody that's been born with. Yeah. And at least, you know, for Michelle yeah. and these INS exams, like she's made a deal with me that for these people who are positive uh, PPDs yeah. on their INS exams, that she's cool with us sending them all down there to get the quantifier so because that's a 250 dollar test mm -hmm. yeah. i can't really do those 250 dollar tests right. so, we'll go for yeah. everybody. so we are not yet like screening everybody from mexico yeah and you know that's you know but at least you're screening folks and you gotta start somewhere you know and and at least you know, if you can't screen everybody from mexico then you pick um then you might say well maybe i'll start with folks from Mexico who have an A1C greater than 10. You know, and that way it's a little bit, you know, an easier sort of population to start with in terms of just getting your hand, you know, getting a handle on it. And then once you've actually been able to improve um, TB testing in that and those folks, then you can say, all right, well, we've, we've been able to do that. Let's kind of, now we'll test everyone who's from Mexico as they would see it. We kind of do that, because diabetes is actually a big risk factor. <coughs> for not only acquisition of TB infection, but progression to active TB. And so there's, there's emerging data about this where folks who, you know, probably an A1C greater than eight is where the risk starts to really increase and then folks are on insulin. So you could start there. Um, and then you could even restrict by age and say, well, maybe we'll, um, if that's too big of a population, then maybe we screen all of our um, foreign-born diabetics 
one seat greater than 10 or less than 50. And then that is an even smaller group. And, uh, and then, then you're at least testing your highest risk population. Age greater than 50. Um, or age less than 50, sorry. Less than 50 is higher risk. Well, so the um, so that sort of gets into lifetime risk oh. and sort of annual risk. And so if you're 50 and you have a normal x-ray um, and you're a diabetic, then your annual risk is probably about 0.2%. Um, and so by the time you're, if you, if you reach the age of 80, then your risk is probably like five or 6%. Um, and so the older you get, you know, the less, the lot, you know, you're gonna live, you know, the, um, the older you are, you know, you're closer to 80 or the you know, less time you have left, if you will, um, to progress. And so, so you kind of look at it that way. Um, you know, just depending on how, like, what your resources are. Right. Um, but I do agree, and, the, and I certainly talk to providers at Lowry and Southwest Penny who are like, oh, I can't even I can't think about it. You know, it's just too overwhelming. Um, but if you kind of start small and then scale, scale up, then it, it's a little more manageable. You know, anyone who comes from a country with elevated TB risk would be someone you want to offer screening to. I know we don't really know what's going to happen with healthcare in the U.S., um, but in theory, um, because this is a preventative service, you know, if the Affordable Care Act stays the same, which I know there's already been some few sort of changes in funding, but in terms of the structure, then this would be a preventative service that's covered. And so, you know, if this is the main reason for the visit, then the patients shouldn't have a copay going forward. Um, so this eventually should get lumped into that. Um, to be honest, since there's been all these changes. I, I don't know exactly where that stands since it's a newer recommendation, but in theory that's where it should head. So if your patient has a positive TSC or IGR, <coughs> so we talked about this a little bit, so you should get a chest x-ray on everyone and ask folks about symptoms. And if their chest x-ray is abnormal in any way, then you would collect speed up on them for AFB. Um, you know, and that's something, you know, once you get comfortable with it, if you have those resources and you could do it here, by all means, you don't necessarily have to refer those folks, but if you're not comfortable and you just want us to see them, we're very happy to see those patients um, and so you can refer them down to um, TB clinics. So we manage all patients with active pulmonary TB where it's mandated by the state. And so at some point we're gonna have to know about them if they have active TB. And so if you wanna refer them early because you're worried, then um, we can certainly see them. And then I do like a quick assessment of other sites of disease, just like a review of systems like you do for anybody. Um, you know, we've had a number, I mean, we've had people with ocular TB, we've had a you know, person with TB in their thumb, shoulder, we've had a number of women with infertility related to TBs, so um, endometrial TB, and so, I, you know, um, there really isn't any, the TB can really present in any organ system. And so, yeah, I would just do a pretty careful review of systems when, you know, when you're thinking about it. And if you're worried at all, like, I have this 32 year old woman and she can't get pregnant, and, you know, amenorrhea, secondary amenorrhea, then have us, you know, we could weigh in on that and how you would work that out. So, um, and then you also want to ask people about prior TB treatment. Sometimes patients, they're like, oh yeah, I was treated for TB when I was a kid. You know, they might remember something once you, you know, they, you know as with all things, you may not remember right away. You also want to do a quick assess for um, toxicity if you're going to think about latent treatment or certainly active treatment. And then if they've had any kind of treatment in the past for latent TB or active. Um, and then if you collect cultures, wait for those results before you start LTV therapy. I've seen providers that don't help start someone on INH when the smears are negative. And um, smears only pick up probably about 50% of people with active TB, so pretty insensitive. Um, so you want to wait for those cultures. That takes two months. Two months. Don't even think someone has active TB. So, um, Panic. Um, so, um, so you kind of you check your own pulse. So, patients wear surgical masks. So, there's good data to show that using a surgical mask, even though it's just catching larger droplets, can reduce transmission. You don't need to make patients wear an N95 mask um, that hasn't been shown to be helpful, and it also is very hard to breathe. N95 mask. Um, so surgical masks is what you do. So just like with flu or anything else, if that's someone coughing in your clinic, ask them to wear a mask, um, you know, whatever your workload is for that, and then, um, you know, quickly evaluate them. 
So um, I kind of mentioned this before, so public health, um, if you initiate treatment for active TB, um, or if you're really concerned, you need to notify us. If you fail to notify us within 24 hours, we'll, we could um, stop you with a $100 fine. We're real serious about that. So let's <laughs> do we need to update that statute. Um, so if you're, I think if you're going to get this to the donation. Point, this the donation to the well-funded TV program. Um, if you are going to, you're thinking about, well, gosh, they have active TV, do I need to isolate them? That's also probably the time when you need to give us a call. Um, if you're going to admit someone and you're worried, you need to put them in airborne. Um, this has come up from before where they there have been uh, instances where they've asked patients to wear an N95 mask in the airborne. Room and you do that. May I ask, like, so back in the day when I used to speak to Randall Reeves, yeah. I actually talked to him even after N95 masks. He felt really good about, you know, so I'm in the room and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this person might have right. TB, which has happened once since I've been here. And, you know, and I masked them and I masked me. By this yeah. time, the cat's out of the bag. Right. And we put the person in a cab and sent them to you. Is that fair? Um, it's okay. Cat part, it's fine. Maybe master so, cat driver. Um, yeah. No, I, I, um, I think that's the best thing to do. And in truth, like these sort of smaller interactions we have, you know, less than you know an hour or so, which is, I mean, you know, it'd be nice if we had an hour with our patients, but we never get that much time. Um, the risk of transmission, you know, even if someone coughs directly on you, is so low. Um, and so these interactions we have with our patients, the chances are that we'll get infected from those interactions is, is really low. Um, you know, I never say zero, but it, it's quite low. I mean, I personally, um, I mean, I'm kind of, I don't know if reckless is the right term, but like I, um, I mean, I've had patients from you to me who have had an extra reading room, one woman who had an MDR2B, and um, when we sat for 15 minutes and I talked to her about her extra, and I haven't been infected, unless I'm allergic. So, um, so I, th I think there's a lot of there's a lot of panic about this, but really, you know, that we start to get really worried about transmission when um, someone's a household contact. So think about household contact: eight hours continuous with someone. Um, you know, we once had a patient whose grandson shared the same bed with him. You know, it's, they had this great relationship, and um, and so those are the kinds of interactions where we're like, gosh, this is concerning for transmission. Um, but our small interactions usually aren't enough. Um, so diagnostic testing for test, so we chest x-ray, AFB smears, AFB sputum culture is the gold standard, um, but it, as I mentioned, six to eight weeks before those are actually finalized. There's a newer test called EXPERT. Um, so newer, so in 2010, um, we, this was one of the first studies looking at EXPERT, it's a nucleic acid test. It was the first new big diagnostic advance for active to be in 100 years, but I'm not bitter, it's cool. Um, but it tests for DNA and sputum samples. So you have a patient cough into a specimen, and then basically 90 minutes later, you put it in this cartridge, it gives you a result. Um, so that's pretty nice. Um, we actually have this at Denver Health, um, and they have it finally at the university. And there's a few isolated um, hospitals that are starting to you, um, obtain these cartridges. So Expert is a sort of brand name, I hate to throw on trade names, but it's one of the best studied um, nucleic acid tests for TB. So I almost have to use it. But um, so the Expert platform is used for other other organisms as well. So like so you can you have the right cartridge to test for Mac A, for Staph aureus, so complain about MRSA, um, C diff, and so there are actually a lot of hospitals who have this platform. They just don't have those cartridges, and so we've been. One of the things that my boss has been doing is talking with other local hospitals to see how we, you know, they have it and how we can maybe support them or encourage them to get these cartridges. Because um, it really can, you know, there have been a few studies looking at trying to sort of rule out folks um, for active TB because um, it's quite good. Um, so if you have someone who's AFB smear positive and you do two of these tests, it'll pick up 100% of those people. And so conversely, if somebody is smear positive and it's negative, um, then that's a good indicator that they don't have TB. Um, and then it can pick up up to 70% of people who were smear negative. So, you know, really within, you know, a day or so, or even less than that, um, you might know somebody has active TB, whereas 
you would have to wait six to eight weeks for those folks to really know for sure. So this new test can be pretty helpful. It's kind of expensive, like all things. Um, I want to say that I mean it, it varies um, depending on where you're practicing, but it's probably at least 120 bucks. Um, again, that varies. Um, this is actually being rolled out globally, and South Africa has actually is sort of systematically replacing. Um, smears with this test, um, but they have a large number of people with drug-resistant TB. Um, so it makes sense for them because this test not only identifies TB, but it also identifies mutations for rifampin, and um, that can be a marker for drug-resistant tuberculosis. So um, this is just kind of a rundown that you're having to try to create a toolbox for diagnosing active TB, um, having um, NAT um, testing, you know, especially for resistance, um, this is sort of the turnaround time. Um, smear, there have been, there's a few outlying counties or community hospitals where experts actually faster than smear because they have to send the smear to a reference lab and they actually have this in-house. Um, so this can vary quite a bit. Um, most cultures actually will turn positive by two weeks, but some, and then probably 70, 80 percent by four weeks. Um, there's only really a handful of patients that I've ever seen that actually it was like six weeks by the time they grew. Um, and then, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have access to this, so this this for us, um, so we, we have culture at Denver Health, um, and then also this is at the state, and then for molecular testing, that's available at CDC and then at National Jewish. Now, obviously, if you're thinking about this, you're going to be talking to us and we're going to support you. But that's kind of what's available these days. Um, so here's a second uh, patient that I wanted to share with you where sometimes everything kind of falls apart. Um, so this um, man was originally from Chicago and in uh, late July of 2016 he developed um, fevers and headache. But I do agree, and, the, and I've certainly talked to providers at Lowry and South of Penya who are like, oh, I can't even I can't think about it, you know, it's just too overwhelming. Um, but if you kind of start small and then scale, scale off and it's a little more manageable. So we've kind of talked about risk factors. We talked about HIV. Um, you guys probably wouldn't see this very much, but we see this more in TB clinic. So people who have upper low fibrotic lesions, so basically have TB infection and Healed up. Um, those folks can have a higher risk of reactivation. Anybody who's on a higher dose of prednisone, organ transplants, someone who's not just malignancies but receiving chemotherapy. And then the other big one, probably for you guys, is chronic renal failure um, or renal insufficiency. So, <coughs> so that's another big risk for um, you know, progression to active TB. Um, I'm a kind of a data person, so I like to use this calculator, um, TST. And I use it to talk to patients about risk. So if you Google TST calculator, you'll get this screen. And so, um, let's see, so I plugged in, so here's someone here. I just plugged in a 50-year-old person from, originally from Mexico. They're not sure if they're obesity vaccinated and they have diabetes. And so, um, so their estimated annual risk is 0.27%. Um, and then by the age of 80, their risk is closer to 8.2%. So, you know, so someone actually who's 50, diabetic, that's someone who you would want to talk to them about latent treatment. Um, you'll find some practitioners, there's some controversy about like lifetime risk, like when do you not necessarily offer latent treatment. I'm sort of on the mind that I'm going to have a conversation with every patient about it, even if their lifetime risk is only 3%, because I think they should, you know, they should be empowered with that information and, and decide if they want to do latent treatment or not. So I've treated, you know, 75 year olds for latent treatment, and we just watch them really carefully. Um, and use right campaign when I could. So, um, but this can kind of give you a sense of their risk. And you kind of uh, mess around with it. You know, if you actually clicked on chronic renal failure and diabetes, this person's lifetime risk would jump to 47%. But this is chronic renal failure requiring hemodialysis, right? right? So it's like pretty severe. That's it's pretty severe. severe. Yeah. So before you get to, you know, sort of end stage renal disease, there, there is still some elevated risk, but it's probably not quite that high. Um, that's a little bit harder to measure. 
So if you guys want this link, you know, where you just Google TSD calculator, you can find it. So we've kind of covered this, um, you know, just about, um, so the TST and um, the IGRA is basically test the same kind of, you know, similar immunity. One tests for effective memory cells, one central memory, but the end result is the same. Um, they're testing for the immune response to TB antigens. Um, hopefully you guys knew this. Um, so the USPSDF updated its recommendations, so um, it's now given a grade B. And so the USPSTF recommends uh, screening for latent TB infection populations at risk. Um, and they kind of loosely define that. They basically say, you know, kind of what we've been talking about from an area of elevated TB prevalence, and then they call out a few uh, countries, mostly because that's where a lot of folks um, are from who moved to the United States. So they called out Mexico, the Philippines, I think Vietnam, and India. Um, so, uh, but, you know, anyone who comes from a country with elevated TB risk would someone you want to offer screening to. I know we don't really know what's going to happen with healthcare in the U.S., um, but in theory, um, because this is a preventative service, you know, if the Affordable Care Act stays the same, you know, there's already been some few sort of changes in funding, but in terms of the structure, then this would be a preventative service that's covered, and so, you know, if this is the main reason for the visit, then the patients shouldn't have a copay going forward. Um, so this eventually should get lumped into that, um, to be honest, since there's been all these changes, I, I don't know exactly where that stands. It's a newer recommendation, but in theory, that's where it should head. So if your patient has a positive TST or IGR, so we talked about this a little bit. So you should get a chest x-ray on everyone and ask folks about symptoms. And if their chest x-ray is abnormal in any way, then you would collect sputum on them for AFB. Um, you know, and that's something, you know, once you get comfortable with it, if you have those resources and you could do it here, by all means, you don't necessarily have to refer those folks, but if you're not comfortable and you just want us to see them, we're very happy to see those patients um, and so you can refer them down to um, TB clinics. So we manage all patients with active pulmonary TB, we're mandated by the state. And so at some point we're gonna have to know about them if they have active TB, and so if you wanna refer them early because you're worried, then um, we can certainly see them. And then I do like a quick assessment of other sites of disease, just like a review systems like you do for anybody. Um, you know, we've had a number, I mean, we've had people with ocular TB, we've had a person with TB in their thumb, shoulder, we've had a number of women with infertility related to TB, so they have uh, endometrial TB. And so, and, you know, um, there really isn't any, the TB can really present in any organ system. And so, yeah, I would just do a pretty careful review of systems when, you know, when you're thinking about it. And if you're worried at all, be like, gosh, I've had this 32-year-old woman and she can't get pregnant, and, you know, amenorrhea, secondary amenorrhea, then have us, you know, we can weigh in on that, like how you would work that out. So, um, and then you also want to ask people about prior TB treatment. Sometimes patients, they're like, oh yeah, I was treated for TB when I was a kid. You know, they might remember something once you, you know, they, you know, as with all things, you may not remember right away. You also want to do a quick assess for um, toxicity if you're going to think about latent treatment or certainly active treatment. And then if they've had any kind of treatment in the past for latent TB or active. Um, and then if you collect cultures, wait for those results before you start melt to therapy. I've seen providers of dental health will start someone on INH when the smears are negative. And um, smears only pick up probably about 50% of people with active TB. It's so pretty insensitive. Um, so you want to wait for those cultures. Takes two months. Two months. What do you think someone is acting to be? So, um, <laughs> panic. Um, so, um, so, you kind of check your own pulse. So, patients wear surgical masks. So, there's good data to show that using a surgical mask, even though just catching larger droplets, can reduce transmission. You don't need to make patients wear an N95 mask um, that hasn't been shown to be helpful. And it also is very hard to breathe. Mask. Um, so surgical masks is, is what you do. So just like with flu or anything else, if that's some coughing in a clinic, ask them to wear a mask, um, you know, whatever your workflow is for that, and then um, you know, quickly evaluate them. So um, I kind of mentioned this before, so public health, um, if you initiate t treatment for active TB, um, or if you're really concerned, you need to notify us. If you fail to notify us within 24 hours, we'll, we could um, slap you with a $100 fine. We're real serious about that. So, 
I need to update that statute. Um, so if you're gonna, I think if you're going to get the right, donation. That's right, it's the donation to the well-funded TV program. Um, if you are gonna, if you're thinking about, well, gosh, they have active TV, do I need to isolate them? That's also probably the time you need to give us a call. Um, if you're going to admit someone and you're worried, you need to put them in airborne. Um, this has come up from before where they, there have been uh, instances where they've asked patients to wear an N95 mask in the airborne isolation room and you can do that. May I ask, like, so back in the day when I used to speak to Randall Reeves, yeah. and I actually talked to him even after N95 masks, he felt really good about, you know, so I'm in the room and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this person wearing right. TB, which has happened once since I've been here. And, you know, and I masked them and I masked me. By this yeah. time, the cat's out of the bag. Right. And we put the person in a cab and sent them to you. Yes. Is that fair? Um, it's okay. Cat part, Maybe mask so, the cat um, Yeah. No, I, I, um, I think that's the best thing to do. And in truth, like, these sort of smaller interactions we have, you know, less than, you know, an hour or so, which is, I mean, you know, it'd be nice if we had an hour with our patients, but we never get that much time. Um, the risk of transmission, you know, even if someone coughs directly on you is so low. Um, and so these interactions we have with our patients, the chances are that we'll get infected from those interactions is, is really low. You know, I never say zero, but it, it's quite low. I mean, I personally, um, I mean, I've kind of, I don't know if reckless is the right term, but like I, um, I mean, I've had patients from UTV who I've had an extra reading room, one woman who had an ERTV, and, um, and we sat for 15 minutes and I talked to her about her extra, and I haven't been infected. Plus, I'm allergic. So, um, so I, th I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of panic about this, but really, you know, that we start to get really worried about transmission when um, someone's a household contact. So think about household contact, eight hours continuous with someone. Um, you know, we once had a patient whose grandson shared the same bed with him, you know, because they had this great relationship. And, um, and so those are the kinds of interactions where we're like, gosh, this is concerning for transmission. Um, but our small interactions usually aren't enough. Um, so diagnostic testing for chest, so we chest x-ray, AFB smears, AFB sputum culture is the gold standard, uh, but as Ed mentioned, six to eight weeks before those are actually finalized. There's a newer test called EXPERT. Um, so newer, so in 2010, um, we, this was one of the first studies looking at EXPERT, it's a nucleic acid test. That was the first new big diagnostic advance for active to be in 100 years. I'm not bitter, it's cool, it's great. Anyway. Um, but it tests for DNA and sputum samples. So you have a patient cough into a specimen, and then basically 90 minutes later, you put it in this cartridge, it gives you a result. Um, so that's pretty nice. Um, we actually have this at Denver Health, um, and they have it finally at the university. And there's a few isolated um, hospitals that are starting to you know, obtain these cartridges. So Expert is a sort of brand name to throw on trainings, but it's one of the best studied um, nucleic acid tests for TB. So I almost have to use it. But um, so the expert platform is used for other other organisms as well. So like so you can you have the right cartridge to test for Bec A, for Staph aureus, and like about MRSA, um, C diff. And so there are actually a lot of hospitals who have this platform. They just don't have those cartridges. And so we've been you know. One of the things that my boss has been doing is talking with other local hospitals to see how we, you know, they have it and how we can maybe support them or encourage them to get these cartridges. Because um, it really can, you know, there have been a few studies looking at trying to sort of rule out folks um, for active TB because um, it's quite good. Um, so if you have someone who's AFB smear positive and you do two of these tests, it'll pick up 100% of those people. And so conversely, if somebody is smear positive and it's negative, um, then that's a good indicator that they don't have TB. Um, and then it can pick up up to 70% of people who were smear negative. So, you know, really within, you know, a day or so, or even less than that, um, you might know somebody has active TB, whereas you would have to wait six to eight weeks for those folks to really know for sure. So this new test can be pretty helpful. It's kind of expensive, like all things. Um, I want to say that, I mean, it, it varies um, depending on where you're practicing, but it's probably at least 120 bucks. Um, again, that varies. Um, this is actually being rolled out globally. 
And South Africa has actually started systematically replacing um, smears with this test, um, but they have a large number of people with drug-resistant TB. Um, so it makes sense for them because this test not only identifies TB, but it also identifies mutations for rifampin, and um, that can be a marker for drug-resistant tuberculosis. So um, this is just kind of a rundown, like if you're having to try to create a toolbox for diagnosing active TB, um, having um, NAT um, testing, you know, especially for resistance, um, this is sort of the turnaround time. Um, smear, there have been, there's a few outlying counties or community hospitals where experts actually faster than smear because they have to send the smear to a reference lab and they actually have this in-house. Um, so this can vary quite a bit. Um, most cultures actually will turn positive by two weeks, but some, and then probably 70, 80% by four weeks. Um, there's only really a handful of patients that I've ever seen that actually it was like six weeks by the time they grew. Um, and then, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have access to this, so this, this for us, um, so we, we have culture at Denver Health, um, and then also this is at the state, and then for molecular testing, that's available at CDC and then at National Jewish. Now, obviously, if you're thinking about this, you're going to be talking to us, and we're going to support you with that. But that's kind of what's available these days. Um, so here's a second uh, patient that I wanted to share with you where sometimes everything kind of falls apart. Um, so this um, man was originally from Chicago, and in uh, late July of 2016, he developed um, fevers and a headache. And um, in August, he went to an urgent care and got doxycycline. And then in late August, um, he went back to an emergency room. This is all in some of the air, um, local community providers. He was given levofloxacin. So levofloxacin actually has excellent activity against MT the drugs that we use to treat uh, multi-drug resistant TB. So hopefully you guys rarely use Levo, maybe, possibly. Um, certainly maybe for pulmonary stuff, maybe for UTIs, but just be mindful of that when you're thinking about some of the might pulmonary TB. Um, and then eventually he was hospitalized. He went um, or was seeking care with a pulmonologist because he had um, upper lobe infiltrates and underwent a VA on a biopsy that wasn't uh, diagnostic. And then after, sometime after that, um, he, is, he, kept, he never really got better. And at one point, he woke up confused. And so his fiance took him to university. Um, and here's his work up here, um, fairly inflammatory CSF, um, which they thought looked like bacterial meningitis. So started him on treatment for that, and including dexamethasone. He kind of got a little bit better, um, but then kind of got worse again and had this extensive workup, and including a QFT that QFT was actually negative. And he started having strokes that kept escalating his antibacterials and antimicrobials, and he died. And then right after he died, his spinal fluid and BAL grew TB a month. So even when you try really, really hard, this is how I feel sometimes about TB in cases like this, um, you know, there's always limitations to our diagnostic tests. So it's always important to, you know, if things aren't making sense, you know, like in this guy, even though it didn't seem like he had epidemiologic risk, um, and we actually still never figured out, he spent some time in a hostel in Spain. In Spain's instance is 12 months and that is as close as we got for every risk for him. Um, there's still gaps, and you still kind of have to, just as we all do as providers, rely on your pretest probability, ask us for advice, you know, since we, you know, we anchored a TV for everybody. <laughs> Um, and and, uh, and think about imperial treatment. And so the reasons for imperial <coughs> treatment um, would be, you know, so in a guy like this, you know, you've done your workup, you don't know what's going on, TB is still on the list of possibilities, even though it might be, you know, 99 out of 100. Um, but if somebody is critically ill in front of you, that actually be the time when you think about it um, and think about imperial treatment. And then the other reasons are far more common, so public health reasons. So, you know, sometimes. So recently, I had a patient who's 73, and she was a nanny. She actually didn't tell us she was a nanny until we diagnosed her with active TB. But she came in with an abnormal X-ray and cough. And we got sputum on her, and if we had known she was a nanny, we would put her on active treatment pending culture results. Um, she didn't share that with us right away, and so we found out she was a nanny when she grew to be a month. Um, but that would have been a situation where we would have went ahead and put her on active treatment pending culture results. 
been around a long, long time. So the standard for drug therapy hasn't changed in 60 years. That's okay. Um, not better either. Um, and then these are sort of the side effects that you can see here. Um, and then we kind of talked about drug-resistant TB, which we're fortunate we don't see very often. And um, so extensively drug-resistant TB is MDR plus um, resistance to fluoroquinones and second-line agents. All right, so if you have done um, your quantiferon or IGRA or your TST and chest x-ray and patient feels well, then what do you do? Well, then you can actually start on late treatment. Um, and we actually don't have to see folks for late treatment at Denver Health. Um, now, we do see people um, at no cost to them, so we'll see people irrespective of pay or source. Um, so we can provide rifampin for free, we can do the chest x-ray for free, um, the quantiferon for free. So. You know, that might be a reason to send someone to us, but if you, um, if patients do, are able to um, gain, get a chest x-ray and it's not financially burdensome for them or pay for their right pamphlet, you guys can, can do this. Um, so, um, so right pamphlet is our first line treatment. It's four months. The big problem with right pamphlet is that there's substantial drug interactions, but it's better tolerated than isoniazid for nine months, and there's better completion rates so patients are able to stay on it and finish. Um, we get LFTs if people are above the age of 50 or if they have liver disease, um, if they're within three months of pregnancy or being postpartum. And then we'll repeat only if they're abnormal or if they have symptoms. Um, we also don't, I mean, we'll still treat folks who regularly consume alcohol. We talk to them a lot about it. We might follow them more frequently and um, we'll check their LFTs more often. And so then, um, have you guys heard about ionic rifapentine? Mm -hmm. It was, right it's more of a public health thing. What is it? Um, INH and rifapentine in combination. Mm -hmm. So right now, this is the shortest regimen that we have for late TV. So it's three months, once a week. Um, and so it's INH, so rifapentine is a form of, it's kind of a form of right it's rifamycin. Um, and they've, they studied it in 2011, doing this once a week compared to nine months of INH, and it was similar efficacy. Um, and so the dosing is based on, is sort of weight-based dosing, and this is sort of when we do LFTs. Um, it was originally studied as directly observed therapy, where people would have to come in once a week and get their dose. More recently, um, we've evaluated it, um, comparing adherence um, self-administered, so patients take their medicines on their own like they would, you know, their whole design. And, um, and then we see them once a month to assess their side effects. Um, so they'll get, you know, four doses, if you will, and then we see them monthly. Um, and that had less, less, you know, there was less adherence compared to direct observed therapy, but it wasn't to the point that it reached statistical significance. And so we've been actually offering this self-administered in TB clinic for about 18 months. And it looks like, preliminarily, that our adherence rates are similar to their when you're looking at pharmacy refills. So um, currently, so I've We've gotten this approved on the Denver Health Medicaid formulary. I think it still requires a prior off um, for Colorado Medicaid, but that's something I'm going to work on. Um, and so it might be a little bit more expensive than right hand for your patients, depending on what their payer source is. Um, it's also a lot of pills. So the right of is like six pills, and the INH is like three pills. So it's just a lot to take. And so sometimes that um, deters people from wanting to stay on this regimen. Um, but the, the tolerability is similar to INH in terms of risk of hepatotoxicity. So hopefully in the future you guys might have more um, access to this regimen and be able to offer it to patients. So. And then you can still offer INH um, for nine months. There's other ways that you can offer it, uh, but nine months is typically standard. Um, and so, you know, to kind of wrap things up, you know, obviously active TB is uncommon. Colorado. It's certainly, you know, rare. I, you know, call it a rare disease. Um, but TB infection is not is is more common. And so it's important to think about that um, and think about the different ways that TB can present. Um, and you know, I think the other thing that's important is for us to kind of work together to figure out how we, as public health folks, can support you guys to do some screening. Because um, as I mentioned in the beginning, I, I really think it's a systems issue. It's like we want to offer screening, but you know. You got 15 minutes with someone, and they've got their agenda, and you've got your agenda, and sometimes they don't. You know, <coughs> Dr. Google, Dr. Facebook.
book, <laughs> and then you can't, you just can't get to it. So that's, I think, the key question is how do we, um, how do we do this? And certainly, it never helped. The biggest gap is testing. Um, it's not necessarily treatment. We kind of look at the gaps in care. So, I mean, I think that the, it's not hard to test for the PPD. I mean, that doesn't require any more time. Yeah. So what do you do with the result if you're going to test right. that? Many So then, you know, would the workflow be that either you start with a smaller group or do you send some of them to us, um, you know, or outline, you know, there's other local public health departments that might be closer than, than, than Denver Metro to the clinic, might be able to help. I think that's the question. Like, how do we you know, work together to figure that out? Yeah. Yeah. Should, I mean, just at a well visit, if somebody has lived in Mexico at some point and hasn't been vaccinated and they're sure of it, can we just do PEDs there? Is that like a good place to start? That's pretty tangible. And if they're positive, we either obtain the x-ray or send them to you. <laughs> so you can, although the vaccinations can sometimes interfere with the um, TST to kind of space them apart in time. So it's a good time to assess risk, but you might actually have to bring them back a month or so later or do the TST first and then do the vaccinations after you read the TST. So MMR Which is the one that interacts oh, okay. um, with, with TST. So um, I'm happy to report that my first case actually had happy endings, so she's doing great. Oh, good. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah, she's back at work. Do we have to boost all these people? You know, uh, that's a good question. Um, I would say, yeah, um, we don't in TV clinics um, boost folks. We just do the TST. So, uh, but I know, you know, that's like for healthcare workers, that's what's... We do for healthcare workers. Yeah, we do. Uh, but we haven't on a routine basis. Like, you know, you, you should, you know, live to Vietnam, comes in for testing. Uh, we don't have to those folks. What we would like is a little study for the funding. So we can just, anytime we draw someone's blood, we'll just set off a QNF with it. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? That's our little public health dream, right? Oh, my gosh, yes. And you're doing that at some places in Denver Health? Well, we haven't yet. So what we're, what I'm hoping, my sort of pipe dream is to get a best practices board that automatically orders a clinic urine for our providers. And so they get searches the EMR for risk. And then it just orders it and tells the provider, your patient is at risk for tuberculosis infection. Um, quantic urine is going to be drawn at the next lab draw. And so that it gets lumped in with everything else. Um, so then it's convenient for the provider and it's convenient for the patient. That's awesome. So in practice, I haven't gotten every, I'm glad you guys are excited. We can have you talk to other people at Denver Health. Um, so where we're at with that right now is I've got, so there's one colleague of mine who's an EPIC analyst, who's an OBGYN, who wants to increase TB testing among pregnant women. And so she's teaching herself how to build a BPA in EPIC. And, um, and then she's, you know, we'll see how that goes. But we haven't been able to get, um, the time for like from one of our epic analysts to do this um, and I was going to try to seek funding for it to pay them to do it but then they were allocated to other activities and so they kind of fell apart but so we'll keep pushing hopefully we can get there um, I had the needles of breast patient a couple years ago that I was trying to like to get a biopsy for air fever and abduction yeah. and indra but I, I can't remember what how I ended up sending that the biopsy do you have any recommendations about how to catch TB on the skin biopsy? Yeah, so I would send it, so that's tough. Um, we ended up, we end up usually relying on the path. Um, so typically my advice would be like for any specimen, send half to um, the lab for culture and then the other half to the path. What often happens is, you know, you kind of back into the diagnosis because you're not thinking about TB and then everything goes to a path. And then once it's dipped in formula, like we can't, you know, we can't culture it. Um, but with skin, I mean, with erythema and duratum, you almost never see organisms, you almost never grow it. Um, and so it's usually just the path for the end, you know, brain So, just, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, well, thank you so thank much, you much Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> this was two years in the making, yeah. I swear. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then I can't remember, but that's my contact.